Hey, thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, today we will continue um, with knots and I would like to show you more about knots. Maybe let's just have a look what we want to do again. So a knot is this type of object here. It's an embedding of a string uh, in three space. So we have more examples, I had more examples on some of the previous slides. So here, all of these are different uh, knots. And just as a reminder, I will pull up one of the videos. It will end up, uh, I will upload them to Canvas, so in case, in case you want to watch them again. So really, just the idea is pretty easy. We take a string, and you could really imagine this as having it in your hand, like, a, like, like really just a string, you know, your shoelaces or whatever. Um, and it turns out because topology is so flexible, so if you don't glue the ends together, then you can always undo it, and that's a bit boring, so we just glue the ends together and call whatever comes out a knot. And you can already see in this picture that it's somehow really believable that you can't undo um, this knot here. And we are kind of looking for ways to make that more formal. So last time I essentially just motivated or tried to motivate the whole story, uh, but eventually we would like to look for more formal ways of studying um, knots. For example, I haven't told you actually what equivalence of knots is or uh, what a knot is precisely, but essentially you can do everything to it except cutting it. Cutting it is always a bad operation. It changes the topological type, and as you can see now, it will, uh, you can undo it. it. The video will undo the knot in a second, right? So if you cut it, you can just undo it. Uh, there you go, it's gone. And that's a bit boring, so you don't want to do that. Um, so the formal way to do this is the following definition that I had up last time, but I skipped it a little bit, uh, so let's have a look. So the intuitive definition is essentially everything you need, but I need to put up the, um, the formal definition as well, and it's just an injection of S1. So S1 is uh, the, the circle. It's, so this S1 is really just this, this guy here. It's an injection of S1 into three space, and the one that we call the unknot is kind of a standard injection, uh, how you would draw S1 in three space, right? And in, injective here means there are no self-intersections. So those pictures never intersect. And the only thing I'm doing here um, in those pictures is that they sit in three space and I project them down into two space and remember uh, which one goes over or under. That's all that's happening in those, those little pictures. So if you just, it's kind of, they're really kind of easy to draw. So if you want um, to draw those pictures here, for example, you go under, you go over, you go under, you go over, you go under, you go over, and it should be one of those. It's probably this one here. Okay. And we want to ask the question, well, first of all, we need to make, the, make it precise what it means for knots to be equivalent, but it kind of should be exactly what you have in mind. Like if you build them out of rope and you manipulate them in some form, then they, they should be equivalent if you can just, well, pull one into the other, just manipulating the rope um, without cutting it, and we want to make that a bit precise. But knots are kind of fabulous object, and they turn up like, like everywhere. So we really would like to uh, understand what they are. And there's some really difficulty involved. So my picture here below um, is an unknot. So it is a circle. You can undo this, but it's like terrible. Uh, and those guys have names. They're called demons. Yeah. It's a demon, it's a very difficult projection of, of the unknot, and they're arbitrary difficult ones. So this is actually an easy one compared to, you can have billions of crossings and it looks like, like a whole mass and you can still undo it. So we really need some, some kind of good tools to study knots. And it will turn out that in, in contrast to surfaces where we had a complete answer, not some more complicated, so we won't get a complete answer, we, we, we could get kind of semi-complete answers. So knot theory is still an open, mostly an open field, uh, a field that is mostly open, um, and we're only kind of scratching the surface, which is still cool. So there will be some really beautiful mass um, topology and knot theory involved. Right, I hope that the question is clear. This is the whole question that we will try to address all the time. When is a knot the unknot, or when are knots the same? kind of the same type of question. 
by just trying to look at the different projections. Here, for example, all of these guys, um, really, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that you kind of can kind of visualize that in your brain that this guy is sitting in three space. All of these guys are just the unknown, and that's kind of easy, but some of them are really, really tricky, uh, like the bottom one, where essentially our visual intuition just, just fails. It just, it just doesn't work anymore. It's just too complicated. Okay, so we want to be able to tell them apart. So I should tell you when two knots are equal, and the definition is like, it turns out that it's really difficult, and it's kind of one of the things, I will pull it up, but I really don't want you to look at it, uh, so really keep the definition, we, we manipulate them in mind, and then I give you a combinatorial definition, which is somehow much, much better. Um, but somehow, well, this is how it goes. It's somehow sometimes very difficult to write down an intuitive definition in formal mass. It's somehow really difficult sometimes, and this is, this is a good example. So I, as I said, I will pull it up, but, but please somehow ignore it. So I need to pull it up for completeness, but I kind of don't want to, um, don't want to look at you. I uh, don't want you to look at it. Okay, so when are two knots are the same? Maybe homeomorphic is actually the correct notion for knots. We had that already. In principle, if you revisit that definition, in principle, you can apply it for knots. But the problem with homeomorphic is that it doesn't see the ambient space. It doesn't see how a surface, for example, sits in whatever, R4 or R3 or whatever. So it only sees the surface. But the whole point of a knot is that it somehow sits kind of complicated in R3. So if a homeomorphism can't tell, can't tell me anything about the embedding, it, it should be some the wrong notion. And it turns out it is. So that's why we need a slightly more different notion. So every knot is homeomorphic to a sphere because it's just the image of one in some space. In other words, if you would like to study knot theory with homeomorphism in mind, everything would be the same. So that's, that's kind of not a good answer, right? So there, there might be some questions of the form, are those two knots equal? Well, they won't be because equal will be the definition that will come up li like on the bottom of the slide. Um, or are two knots homeomorphic? Yes, they are always homeomorphic. All knots are just spheres, uh, are just circles. They're just, the point is they're, they're the kind of complicated embedded in space. And that's what makes them so interesting not the underlying structure that they are circles. They are just old circles. So homeomorphism is a wrong notion. Yeah? It's really just warning, it's really wrong. It, it doesn't help here at all. It's not the correct answer. So we need something, something different. Right? Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe doing this way is a bit better. Let me try again. So this is really the wrong answer. OK, so we need something different. And we will call that equivalence of knots. So this is not correct, and it will lead us to the slide that I pull up in a second. Um, I just pull it up, but it actually doesn't matter. So it is, that's the definition of equivalence. So it, essentially they're equivalent if you can find a pass in R3, so there's R3 in the picture that deforms one into the other. And it's exactly what you think. Um, what you think it is, and in practice we will never use that, um, we'll just, just, just use your intuition. It, it's just making this, this moving a, a knot in three space precise. And the difference to an homeomorphism is that it's always fixed on R3. So it's a deformation in R3 that pulls one knot to the other. Instead of an homeomorphism, it's an abstract deformation of, of the space. Cool. And the knot is called trivial if it's the unknot, and otherwise it's, it's not trivial. Right. Okay. I will show you a better definition in a second. As I said, don't look at it too much. Maybe this is the main point. Homeomorphism is not quite the right notion. So we need a more complicated notion. Turns out it's not so bad if you reformulate that in terms of co combinatorial data instead of, uh, this is maybe analytic, this is coordinate based, and I will show you a, an, equivalent, um, an equivalent combinatorial formulation. I pull this one up because that's essentially what the example do. I have three types of objects and they are all different. So please don't compare them naively, right? It's like comparing apples to oranges. You have graphs and the equivalence is isomorphism of graphs. You have surfaces and for them the correct notion of equivalence was homeomorphism. And for knots, the equivalence is, well, well I make that more precise in a sec. But it's neither of the other. So there are some questions, is it not a graph? A knot is not a graph. 
is it not a surface? Is not a not, not, it's not a surface. Is a graph a surface? A graph is not a surface. Right? They're all different. So we are really studying three different subjects here. They're all different. I mean, they all have the same type of flavor. That's why they're all bunched together under the notion of topology. But they're still formally different objects. So we can't compare them directly, and we don't want to compare them directly. Yeah, so for not, for example, the embedding is crucial. How it sits in space is the whole point of knot theory. And that's just not important for any of the others, for example. So never, ever compare them. They're really different. And these are the three main topics of this lecture. So three different topics. And that's just what it is. They, are, they look similar, and we have similar methods. That's pretty good. But in, in the end, you, you can't compare a knot to a graph. It's just somewhat a different object. I hope that makes some sense, just as a warning. Right? They're there. And there are also different notions of being equal. Okay. Um, and what we will really do, so because the definition was a bit tricky in the beginning, is I would like to only study knots that you can draw. And remember what we done with surfaces is I, I, I said surfaces are the following type of object. And they are fine. And then we associated a polygon form to a surface, which kind of made the life much easier. And we'll do the same. Um, for knots. So general knots, I will have some really fancy pictures in a second. General knots are just too complicated and we make it a little bit easier. And then work with these combinatorial objects, which I call polygon, poly, polygonal forms of knots. It's really the same as a polygonal form of surface, kind of the same type of idea. Right? Coming back to this slide, always the same type of ideas, but the objects are still different. Right? So it's the same type of idea as associating a, a polygon to a surface, like a polygon knot to a knot. Same type of idea, but it will look a little bit different. Hopefully, that's reasonably clear. Okay. Oh, that's what I just said. I sometimes don't remember what I put on the slides, actually. There you go. So just like polygon decomposition, this pushes everything into uh, combinatorics. So let's do an example. Instead of drawing a circle, for example, I could draw a triangle. That's a polygon form of a knot. So polygon form really means you have, um, it's piecewise linear. So there are linear parts everywhere up to a certain point. So it's piecewise linear, so it's linear here, it's linear here, it's linear here. And piecewise is exactly saying that it's not quite linear. So I could draw a knot and a knot as a, uh, as a triangle or whatever kind of thing you want, as long as it's kind of piecewise linear. And that's a polygon form of a knot. Here's a trefoil. So the trefoil, just as a reminder, was, uh, where are we? One, one slide before. The trefoil, too many slides, is the first non-trivial knot, the one with three crossings. It's called the trefoil. Right? So three, some of three is built into the name. So here's a knot, as a knot, right? as an embedding of a string. And a little bit further down my slides, Somewhere here, this is a polygon form of a knot. So it makes sense. It's kind of piecewise linear. And here's another polygon form of some knot. And you can imagine that it gets very fine, and you can have uh, various different um, polygon forms of knots. Whatever, and more polygon forms of knots. So in this case, a polygon form is actually really simple. It's much, much simpler than for a, for a surface, because a knot is a one-dimensional object. It's really just a string. And a polygon form is just some piecewise linear presentation of a knot. Hope that makes some sense. And it's now easy to see what equivalents for those guys are, which are not quite all knots, but kind of all knots we care about in this, um, in this lecture. They're equivalent if they have a common subdivision. If you just think of this as being a graph, and now you can put in more, um, so you can do this operation, essentially. So you have a line, and then you can make a little triangle into the line, yeah, something like this. Yeah. So you get subdivided further, make finer breaks, make it even kind of finer, kind of approximated to the smooth version um, in every step. And they're equivalent, and this is a much better definition in some sense, um, if and only if there's a common subdivision. It's, it's not as scary, it's just kind of believable. It's not as scary as um, this shit here, 
but for the, and, and that's exactly why we do it, right? It's a kind of a polygon form of a knot. And because you can make this as fine as you want, instead of drawing a triangle, you can draw a very, very fine n-gun, like with, with trillions, of n, trillions of edges and vertices, so that you can't distinguish that from a circle anymore anyway. So these kind of approximate any, any knot you can draw anyway. So you never need to worry about it. Anything you can draw will be of this type anyway. It's kind of the magic. So we kind of reformulate it a little bit, and everything becomes a much easier. But I will kick out some examples of really strange and crazy knots. Okay, I hope that makes sense. You can make it finer and finer and finer, so a polygon form essentially will just look, look to your eye, will just look um, like it's smooth anyway. Right, and we're only studying those, and I really kicked out some to make the definition easier. And I just, I just pull up some of the, some of the pictures of uh, the polygon form of knots. And then we will forget about it, because as I said, everything you can draw is of this type, so we can somewhat forget about it. But these are really the objects we study. So here are knots that are not polygon forms of knots. Whenever you have some, some limiting point, because then you can't make, can't make your, your linear pieces. But these are all knots, like a trefoil, and then you put trefoils on the trefoil, and you put trefoils on the trefoil of the trefoil. Um, these are all legal knots. These are all embeddings of S1 into R3, but they're not polygon knots. And I claim you can't really draw them anyway. So those guys are kicked out. And if you kick those out, um, then the definition gets much, much easier. Okay. Polygon knots, everything you can draw, but there are some examples that don't, that don't show up. Whenever you have something that kind of is limiting to some point, you can't make that piecewise linear. It just doesn't work. And honestly, I don't want to study those guys anyway. They have a name, they're called wild knots. So the whole, if you want to study wild knots, those guys here, um, then it, it's a different subject. You, you need different methods. What we are going to do is we are going to do combinatorics. And I will reformulate the problem in a second for you. So here are more examples of things that are not polygon knots. Right? Kind of a, something that is knotted in itself infinitely often, shrinking to a point. That's a, a legal embedding of S1 into space, but it's not a polygon knot, like something like this. It's ex extremely crazy. It just shrinks, and eventually you can't draw nice lines anymore because it kind of gets arbitrary uh, small. And if you kick them out, you kind of get a, get a better description. All I said is here, we are not studying all knots, we are studying the combinatorially nice ones. But everything you can draw is on this list anyway. So I hope that uh, makes some sense. So these are not polygon knots, but fine. Okay, let me reformulate the question. So, um, knots look a bit scary, but it's actually not so bad. So what I really want to do is, uh, let me pull up the video again. I think it was this one, we'll see. What we really, oh yeah, there you go. What you, what you really want to do is we have some knot huh, somewhere in space, but it's somehow much easier to just draw the projection on, onto, uh, onto the plane, because that's what I can draw on my two-dimensional screen here. My screen is just a plane. So I don't have a, uh, a much fancier screen. So the, the best I can draw is actually such a picture, so you would like to study such pictures instead, and then just do all the combinatorics just on those pictures. Right? I just remember um, which one goes over and under. And this is called a knot projection or a knot diagram. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. So, knot projections. Okay, okay, a knot projection is really just a drawing of a knot in R2 such that you have those local pictures, and otherwise it's it's just a string that you connect. So you either go over or under, um, depending on whether the knot goes over or under. Okay. They involve a choice of a projection. I will show you an example in a second. So um, it's similarly with the, with the polygon decompositions. Several polygon decompositions can give the same surface. Several knot projections correspond to the same knot. So we kind of want a method to just look at the projection because the projection is easy, um, kind of easy to draw. So everything I've drawn so far, they are all projections. 
They're all projections. Let me find a weird better picture mm, before this slide. So these are all projections of the same knob. All of them are projections of the same knob. So we want a method to kind of, because projections are easy to draw, we want a method to tell uh, the knot from the projection. I hope that makes some sense. Good, let's go back. Too many slides. Pop, pop, pop. Okay. This is my picture of a projection, right? So think of having a knot somewhere. So the real object is the one in the middle. So here's a knot. Uh, this was a bad color. Maybe red helps. So this is a knot and it sits somewhere in three space. But we are only looking at the shadows. But there could be different shadows depending on how you project your knot. Right? So there could be different shadows depending on how you project your knot. Here's another knot. This was a bad choice of color. Let me, let me try again with red. Here's another knot. Somewhat sits complicated in three space. And it projects, has different type of projections. And we're always looking at the projections for the easy reason that I can draw them, you know, and they're two dimensional, they're, 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 they are drawable in the plane, so that makes them uh, nice. But there might be, might be more than one projection associated to a knot. Usually there are infinitely many projections to, associated to a knot. Right? Just think of you can continuously move your light source around. Very good. Right? Does that make some sense? So that's a knot projection. Everything I ever draw is a knot projection. Let me pull up another video to make sure um, we kind of get a good, good idea of what a projection is supposed to be, because there could be really bad projections and we don't want them. So this is a knot, um, someone nicely knotted in, in three space, whatever it is, and we want to uh, project it down. Very good. So now, I will draw, now the, the video will draw a projection. And this is a really awful projection, and we don't want those. So let's have a look why this is an awful projection. So on the left is now the projection. And we don't like those for the following reasons. So we, I don't like triple points. I always want to move it a little bit away. So I don't want three strings at one point. That's bad. I don't like this one when they go in parallel. So you can just move it a little bit further. Um, that's also bad. And here again, they move in parallel. We don't like that. And um, then there is this little strange kinky where one strand is right on top of another. So we also um, don't want that. So what you can do is you can just make it a little bit simpler and so that everything locally is just um, a nice, right? You just move it a little bit. And you get rid of the, the triple point. And you only have double points locally. You just move this one a bit, and there is no problem anymore. And we'll see a good projection in a second. We just need to get rid of the other two. So now it moves this one a little bit. Yeah, this one looks much better. Now it's a good crossing. Now it's a nice double point, and now you can move this one a little bit. It doesn't change the structure of the knot. It just makes our, our projections a bit easier. Right? So this one is a good one. Um, so now we have a good projection of our knot. I right? hope that makes some sense. So all of our knot projections just locally have only those, uh, the worst case is they have the double point, one strand going over, over another. And I don't want like four strands on top of one another. That just makes the picture too complicated. But you can always like of pull a little bit so that it gets um, a bit easier. Right. So that's what I call a projection. So that's why locally, I only have those two, right? And I never have, I never have another string uh, going on top, so that's bad. We don't want that. Okay. But you can always, if you have that, you can always just say, okay, the string goes a little bit like this, and then it's okay. And then it's, uh, it's fine, right? So this one is then okay. Fine. So it's not really a restriction, just making our drawings easier. So locally, you only see ever, you only ever see um, those little pictures. Yeah, so here are all projections of the trap wall. They're all different projections of the same knot. Different ways to draw it. And it's sometimes not so, not so easy to see. Okay. Nine different ones. Okay. And on the projections, we have a really, really beautiful theorem. And I will pull that up like, like a million times because it's important. We already had that last time. 
on a projection, we can say when two knots are equivalent, and that's an if and only if one, and you can take that as a definition of equivalence of knots if you want. So on a projection, uh, two, two knots are the same if and only if they're related by these not too difficult moves. So you can just wiggle a string, or you can undo a kink. They're labeled from zero to one, so you can just wiggle the string, you can undo a kink. This one is like, like an operation that pulls two strings apart. And the other one, the final one, that looks a bit, well, it doesn't actually look so difficult. There's some crossing in front and the strand that clearly goes in the back, and you can just move that strand up and down, because the other one is in the front. Hope that makes some sense. And it turns out um, that these are all. Oh, so knots are equivalent if and only if you can find a sequence, a finite sequence of those moves um, relating them. And we had, we had uh, so let me try to find it again. We had an illustration last time. Here we go. Are they the same? Well, you can always do some moves. And they're always labeled one to 0, 1, 2, 3. So this one, you can undo it. The, the blue strand is in the back, so you undo it. And that's the th second move, for example. Uh, let's try to have a look at the second move. It was the second move. Yeah, you can undo this one. This is the, the first move. You can then do a kink. Um, this is the first move. You can undo a kink. Um, and this one here, if you now pull the blue string, which is in the back, if you just pull it down, that's the third move. And just some sequence of moves uh, connecting those, and that's, that's, another, that's another one. So it's actually not so bad. It's just four moves. And the first one is kind of usually used silently. So maybe three moves. And you can take that as a definition of equivalence of knots. So whenever you can relate them um, using those, those moves. And that's, that's a really important theorem. Like the, it, it has a name, right? Theorems with names are always good. It's named after a mathematician called Reidemeister. So it's called um, Reidemeister theorem. It's kind of difficult to prove, but we kind of take it, um, it's kind of our main main theorem in this part. And why is it difficult to prove? Because it really works with the original definition of equivalence, which is like difficult to write down. But you can use it. It's kind of a really fantastic theorem, because now it's it formulated not theory now completely in terms of combinatorics. It's an, a game on strings where you have three rules that you can apply. Right? You can undo a kink. You can pull two strings apart. And it, this funny move for which I don't have enough arms, when there is one string in the back, and let's say a crossing um, in the front. It's actually really beautiful, really, really elegant. Right? Only three moves. Way easier than for surfaces. There's only three moves um, that you can play on. And everything else, everything you ever write down will be a composition of those, of those moves. It, it reduces topology to combinatorics, which is fantastic. So you just you ever, you, you ever only need to play with diagrams. It's always good to have the three-dimensional picture in mind, but we don't need to. It's like with, for, for surfaces, we actually only need to play with polygons, and we don't really need to know what a surface is. And for knots, we only ever need to play with diagrams and we, or with projections. Um, so I sometimes say projection and diagram doesn't mean the same. Um, with projections, and we never need to really worry about any more fancy questions. I pulled them up again because they are, the picture was slightly smallish. Hopefully, it's a bit better to see now. Really easy moves, right? It's kind of easy to convince yourself that they hold. If you have a string that is in front and a string that is in the back, you can just pull them apart. That's not very difficult. Um, third one is also very easy. First one is also not so bad. And the, the point is, these are everything you ever need. So everything will be built out of, out of those moves only. A really fascinating statement. It's really, really important. So I just have one slide just for those moves. Hope it's reasonably easy to remember. Okay. And now we ask the question, are they the same? So is there some sequence of moves, of moves that relate one to the other? So remember that the trefoil is always the one with three uh, kind of, what is it? Three uh, outpointing. Um, 
bumps. That's a trefoil because it kind of looks like a trefoil, I guess. Um, and the unknot is just the circle itself. So are they the same or not? Using the definition, using the Rider Master move. So is there a sequence of some Rider Master moves that puts one into the other? There's not, but how would we show that? So they're not the same. Let me just spoil the story. They're not the same, but how would you show that? It's kind of a little bit difficult because you kind of need to convince yourself that there is no move, no, no set of moves, and a priori a set of moves can get like, like really, really complicated, right? So are they the same? I claim it's clear that they're different. I hope you agree, but, but so far we can't really do that, right? So it's kind of a um, if you build them out of rope, if you really don't believe me that they're different, try to build them out of rope. They're, they're really seriously different. You can't unknot um, the trefoil. But right now, we can't really tell. That's a bit, a bit of a problem. Same stage <laughs> where we were at the beginning of, of surfaces. I had a definition with polygons, but we really, or a homeomorphism, but we really couldn't tell in any form how are they, are they different or not. We're in the same stage here. And I show you one, one way to do it well, in the remaining like 20 minutes. And the rest of next week is about different ways of trying to do this. Um, because it turns out that it's a bit more difficult than for surfaces in the sense that we won't get a complete answer. Okay. And here comes a cool trick. Okay. So what have we seen so far? Let me repeat that uh, before we continue. So we are studying knots, and if you just want to take this as a definition, what, what knots are up to equivalence, and knots are just drawings in the plane where you remember which strand goes over and under, uh, up to this type of equivalence. So two things are equivalent if they are related by those uh, local moves. And they, this is the theorem, which I'm unable to prove because it's kind of, kind of really difficult, um, is that this is exactly the, the definition of having a string in three space that I was talking about the whole time. But we somehow don't need to know that. Okay, and the main question we have is, are knots equivalent? Is the trefoil, is, is the trefoil the one on the right? Is that actually the unknot? Is some knot I would draw down here? So let me just try to draw a knot. I hope, hope probably will hopefully, hopelessly fail. Uh, something like this maybe. Okay, this was a reasonably bad drawing, but anyway, let me try to make this a little nicer. Whoop. Is this the unknot or not? I guess it is. But um, we would like some nice ways to, to check that. So this is clearly the unknot or not. Very bad. But anyway, uh, so is this one, this one, question mark? Is this one, this one, question mark? Or whatever you draw, will it be one of those? Or is it a new knot? Have you found a new knot? all of these um, type of questions. Okay, how do we do that, right? Seems to be difficult. I show you now one, one fantastic trick. And it's kind of, it's, it's really fantastic. It's like, it's very easy somewhat. Um, and then it can already tell several nodes apart. So we'll do the following. It's probably better to put up a picture. So a, a, a coloring of a projection is you just give a color to, um, to every segment of the projection. So this one is broken here, so that's why this one can get red, this one can get green, and this one is unbroken, so it just gets one color. So my three colors, I'm using three colors all, all the time here, and the three colors are red, green, and blue. And the rule is I either want everything to be monochromatic, Right, so I can have uh, a completely, this is supposed to be a completely red crossing, for example. I could have a completely blue crossing or a completely green crossing, something like this. Okay, so monochromatic, this is kind of a boring case, or I want all colors to be present. So blue, red, and green in all possible forms. And that's what I call a coloring. Okay, I will pull up some examples. Let me pull up some examples. So here's a, and then we go back in the slides. So here are uh, nine, three colorings of the trefoil. So every segment gets a color such that at every crossing, you either see the boring pictures 
So these guys are boring. So at every crossing, you just see all colors. Uh, everything is monochromatic. Or at every crossing, you see all three colors. So here you see all three colors. Right? So you see all three colors at every, absolutely every crossing. I have another one for you. Um, maybe a bit easier to see. So I'm using three colors, blue, red, and green. And at every crossing, you see all three of them. And this is an example of a three coloring. And because there are three colors, it's called a three coloring. At every crossing, there's blue and the green and a red string. So that's what I call a coloring. Let's go back. And I will count the number of colorings. C like coloring, three like three colors, and K like the knot is the number of different colorings um, of my knot. So um, this case is always a boring case. So if I'm asking, is there a three coloring, I'm never interested really in this case. Okay? I will make that more precise later. So you can always color every knot just with a single color, which is completely boring, because then you don't need to color it at all. Okay. But fine. So the number of colorings is it's always at, most, uh, at least three, because you always have the monochromatic green coloring, the monochromatic blue coloring, and the monochromatic red color. And we're really interested in the difference between, well, how many are there? Are there more than three? Okay, so that's really the point. So I, I will kind of ignore this case. It is kind of boring. Okay, and the question is, we call it a not three colorable, exactly in the same flavor as I just said, if and only if there is one interesting coloring. Let me make this clear again. So this is what I call uh, an honest a, a three coloring. I will drop the honest. I'll just call this a three coloring. Something that is not monochromatic. Right? If there is one of those, then I'm happy. Then I call it three colorable. There are three colors. Okay. And then this number is bigger than three, and we want to know how big is this number actually. I hope that makes some sense. OK, so the unknot has no crossing. So the unknot is exactly not three colorable because it only has monochromatic colorings. There's no other way you can do it. There's no crossing, so you can't have a crossing with uh, three colors present. And that's why I'm interested in the non-trivial colorings. Because a knot with non-trivial colorings can't be the unknot because the unknot only has trivial colorings. That would be the main result. Note again that I'm, these are called these are three colorings, they're just, but they're so boring that I kind of want to exclude them. So I don't call the unknot three colorable because they're only monochromatic. I don't care about monochromatic coloring. And what about the other ones? Well, we already had an example here for our trefoil. I can pull it up again. And essentially, this will show that the trefoil is not the unknot because. It allows a non-trivial coloring. I will pull up a more, and then we have a little video, I will pull up a more precise uh, statement in a second. Right. And now we can ask this question. So let's assume I will already have proved this, that ha having a three coloring, a non-trivial one, is a not invariant, and it is. And then you can just try to find them and verify that something is non-trivial. Just put it on the knot, like on the trefoil. Because the unknot, by definition, is only monochromatic. There's no other way to do it. And I'm looking for non-monochromatic colorings. I hope that's reasonably clear. OK, so here's our trefoil. And well, I already showed you um, that the number is 9. So it's, it's not trivial. And I just, I just pulled them up. So let me get rid of the decorations here. Um, bash. Okay. So they're the boring ones. Kind of, I don't care. They are boring. And they are the good ones. And there are nine of them. Why are there are nine of them? Well, let's say you fix the top one to be blue. Then you still have two choices what to do at the bottom. Right? You can swap red and green. And you have three choices for the top. So you have uh, two times three choices. So you have six choices. And here you go. And then you have the three trivial ones. Nobody cares about. So the trefoil has nine colorings. So it is three colorable. Nine is bigger than three. I hope that makes sense. Right? You just color every segment of the knot. And it turns out that the integer itself is a knot invariant. 
So two knots are equivalent, if two knots are equivalent, the integers are the same. In particular, the trefoil is not the unknot. Okay? Um, and I will prove the theorem for you with a video. Um, um, but just, just to make sure here, the number itself is an invariant, but finding one coloring is already good enough to kind of distinguish it because um, every, the, the unknot, right, so the unknot is always, this was supposed to be unknot, oh God, this was really bad. Uh, let me get rid of it, let me just cheat, and let me just say it this way, it's three, so whenever you find some non-trivial coloring, the number is an invariant. Your number will be bigger than three, so your knot is not trivial. That's a really fantastic way of doing it. The color is not so fantastic. Let me just make it a bit darker. Make it. Yeah. So finding one non-trivial coloring is already enough. You could be more fancy and just count the whole number, but you don't need to. You just need to find um, one coloring. Yeah. Right? So exactly what I, what I just said. And essentially, you just need to go through the moves, and I will do that um, in, in a video. Let me just pull up the video. Okay. So I will prove it in the video. Okay. So that's first. Um, the problem with the video is it, it uses yellow instead of green. I hope that's okay. So and now the colorings are blue, red, and green, and this one works perfectly well, as you can see. And this one is shit. Yeah? So we don't want that. The, the old colors need to be present. So this one is shit. The monochromatic one is fine, but it's boring. So you never want two colors in one color. So that's kind of the bad case. I hope that makes sense. With every crossing, you have all colors, or you have just the monochromatic one. Fine. With either all of them present or just monochromatic. Very good. Hope that makes sense. Some sense. So here it will now list all, um, all possible nine solutions. It's just swapping all of them, and we have nine possible solutions. So the number, the number of colorings, is supposed to be nine. Awesome. And the number of colorings of the unknot was three. So these guys are different objects. Very good. It's kind of very very easy way to show that. Um, Sometimes you run into trouble. So let's try to color this one. So it gets blue, red. So in this crossing, you need to have to put a yellow, right? But then you're kind of stuck for the final crossing because now you need to put a blue here, but you somehow can't. So this is not three color. It only has the trivial coloring. Now let me try that again. So at this point, you're kind of, nah, a little bit further. At this point, you're kind of stuck. Because the final one, as you can see here down here, the final one needs to be red, right? But it can't be because of this crossing. So this crossing says the final one needs to be yellow. But it can't be because this crossing says the final one needs to be red. So this knot has no three coloring. So in particular, we can't distinguish it from the unknot yet. It works for some knots, it doesn't work for all knots. So it only has the boring uh, colorings in this case. The number of colorings, three. Very good. So let's move ahead. So number of colorings is three. Number of colorings is nine. They're not different, and this one is a bit trickier. Um, and now I will, will prove the theorem for you in the video. So how does it change? It doesn't change at all. That's the whole point. So let's have a look at the randomized numbers. So this is the first one. And if you have a coloring, let's say on the left-hand side, then you have one associated coloring on the right-hand side. So there's a fixed coloring on the outside, and there's one way to fill it up uh, on the inside. So it's perfect match. So the number of colorings doesn't change. It's invariant under this loop. Well, let's try again. So if you have some coloring on the left-hand side, there's an associated coloring on the right-hand side and the other way around. So the number of colorings does not change under this loop. So this move preserves the number of colorings. And all the others do as well. And that's why it is invariant under, under the randomized move. So let's have a look at the second one. Okay. So again, the same game. Some coloring on the left-hand side, right-hand side, should correspond to a unique coloring on the right-hand side, left-hand side. 
and vice versa. So let's just say that it starts with red and uh, yellow, and there's a unique way to fill it up, because the final one needs to be blue in this case. So let's try again. Okay, so ah, this was a bit too fast. So let's say the outside is colored uh, yellow and red. Okay, so let's go a little bit further. Yellow and red. There's only one choice for the final string, right? And the middle string. It needs to be blue. So you need to make it blue, and then there's only one choice for the remaining one, and you have a perfect match of colorings left and right again. So let's do one more. For example, if everything is red on the left-hand side, then everything is uh, red on the right-hand side as well. So it's, again, the perfect match of colorings. The last one is a bit trickier, um, but it works out as well. So it's just listing all possible. It just goes through all uh, possibilities, essentially. The point is, ah, that was too fast. The point is, uh, whenever you have something on the left-hand side, there's a unique way to extend it to the right-hand side. And whenever you have something on the right-hand side, there's a unique way to have a coloring on the left-hand side. In other words, the number of colorings is an invariant. It's invariant under, under those moves. So the number of colorings uh, is just, it associates to every diagram a number, uh, to the trefoil a number, to the whatever this not is a number. And this number is invariant under the moves. So it's actually a not invariant. It's, it's a map from knots to numbers. And it just associates to every knot uh, a certain number. So we can say that those two are not equivalent because 3 is not 9. We can say that those two are not equivalent because 3 is not 9. And uh, we can't say anything about those two because they get the same um, associated number. OK, I hope that's reasonably clear. So essentially, <laughs> what this video that did for me is I was too lazy to color everything. But um, the, the, coloring of the, the colorings on the left-hand side correspond to the right-hand side. And the number of colorings is an invariant so that we can actually say the trefoil is not a trivial net. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. Um, yeah, very good. So let me uh, pull up my final slide just to make this clear again because it's a bit confusing. Fit page, obviously. Just to make this clear again. Uh, three coloring means those guys. Not, not the, I don't want the boring ones. The boring ones are uh, boring. Anyway, so this is the end of the lecture. So what we have seen is maybe the, the really the crucial part. Uh, a lot of videos. I hope the videos were enjoyable. The crucial part were those moves. Um, and two knots are the same, even only if they're related by those moves. And we found a... I showed you one really cute knot invariant, which is just the coloring of strings. And essentially, the proof why it was a knot invariant was just checking that the number of coloring stays invariant uh, under those moves. Anyway, so next week, we uh, have more fun with knots. And there's a lot of more videos, so it's, it will be hopefully very enjoyable. Thank you so much for coming today. And enjoy your weekend.